In the last video, we talked about some of the factors that have gone into changing our Earth's climate. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about what are some of the effects, effects of that change. Um, is increasing the temperature by like two or three degrees Celsius a big deal or not? Uh, and if it is, why is it a big deal? What's, um, what's all of this fuss about climate change really about? So our first big impact that we're going to talk about is the impact of uh, sea level rise. Now, this is one that you've probably heard of before. This map here is, I'm going to tell you right now, an exaggerated look a little bit. Um, this is looking at a very, very much worst case scenario uh, of what the models have to show. Um, but the reason that I, I start with this is uh, to illustrate the importance of understanding like just how big of a deal a sea level rise would be because most of the, the populated cities, or the most populated cities in the US, but also beyond, uh, lie really close to sea level. So you wouldn't need to change um, the amount of uh, increase by very much to see a huge effect in the cities that are, that are impacted. Um, so places like New Orleans or Houston or all of Florida um, will really see an effect of this change. Uh, and you also don't need to have a, a sea level rise that is impacting you all the time to be a big deal. Um, because as we've seen in some recent hurricanes, um, like hurricane that, that hit Houston a few years ago, uh, the biggest factor in the damage that was caused wasn't the winds of the storm itself, but it was the surge of the ocean. Um, since it was already several centimeters higher than it had been before, it didn't take much more in order to increase it beyond the normal floodplains that are being seen um, or have been seen in the past. So let's talk about where the sea level change actually comes from. There are a couple of factors here that you have probably heard of before. Uh, and this first one is going to be about the melting of ice. And this is often what's portrayed in like illustrations about climate change. It's like a polar bear sitting on a melting ice cap, uh, losing its habitat. But melting ice can also be really important because as the ice melts, it is going into our ocean. Now, there are two main types of melting ice that I wanna differentiate between. The first is a melting iceberg does not cause a direct change in sea level, um, but a melting glacier does. So what's the difference between an iceberg and a glacier? Now, to illustrate what an iceberg is, I want to show you a quick demo. If you look at the cup right here, I've got this glass filled all the way to the top with water, and I've added ice to the point that the ice is actually sticking up over the top of the glass. Now, if I were to add any more water to this, the glass would overflow. So think to yourself, would, uh, will it overflow when and if the ice melts? I'm going to turn on this heat lamp. And we're going to see what happens um, to the glass causing the ice to melt and see if it overflows or not. So in that demo, it was representing an iceberg because the ice was floating in the, the liquid it already. Um, it was already there. And the, the way it works out is ice is actually less dense. So it can be sticking up above the glass. And when it melts, doesn't actually make the glass overflow. So even though it looks like there's going to be more water than it could handle, um, as the ice is melting, it's becoming more dense. And it's actually filling that same space, it was displacing the amount of water that it would ultimately become. A glacier is very different because a glacier is ice that is on land. So in this case, the ice isn't floating. Um, and when the ice melts, uh, it doesn't have the same effect that a, an iceberg does because as it melts, it is going into the ocean where it wasn't before. So this factor of an iceberg causes no change in sea level rise. 
uh, a glacier does. So when we talk about melting ice being a problem, we're not talking about icebergs, we're talking about glaciers. A place like Greenland that is covered in a big glacier that is receding uh, very, very quickly. And if we actually look at the two biggest glaciers, uh, the first is the Antarctic uh, ice mass is decreasing at a rate of about 127 gigatons every year. Uh, the one in Greenland is uh, decreasing at a rate of about 286 gigatons per year. This is a huge amount. Uh, now, you might be wondering, as I was, uh, how can they actually measure this? They're not going to put it on a giant scale. Um, well, the answer, I think, is fascinating. Uh, it's measured in large part um, with, with different satellites. That There are two satellites that are in the same orbit. And as a satellite goes over a part of the Earth that is more dense, um, it is increasing the, the local mass. It actually causes that satellite to experience more gravity and causes its orbit to speed up a little bit. So what's happening is these two satellites are constantly communicating back and forth between each other. And they know the distance uh, from one satellite to the other. And if the first satellite crosses over an ice mass uh, that is a significant portion of mass, it's going to speed up and the distance is going to decrease or increase. And then as that second one catches up, goes over that same ice mass, it'll speed up and decrease that distance once again. And the change in the distance can actually be worked backwards to figure out what was the mass of that local area. And from those measurements, uh, we can get a good from space measurement of what the overall mass change is going to be. Because a lot of this melting is actually happening uh, not visibly. It's not melting from the top. It's kind of melting from within in many cases. There is another factor that causes the sea level rise, and that is simple ex thermal expansion. So you might remember from class, we talked about this example of using hot water to make the lid uh, get bigger. So basically expand to make it easier to get a lid off of a jar because the metal expands differently than a glass jar. Well, water also expands. It doesn't expand as much as metal does, but if you have something as big as the ocean, you don't actually need it to expand that much to see a measurable effect. Uh, to show you this, I want to show you another quick demo. All right, for this demonstration, uh, I have a jar of water that's been colored blue. It's just standard food coloring. And in that jar of water, I actually drilled a hole through the top and connected this straw with some sculpting clay. Um, and the straw allows the volume to change. So it can rise or fall. Right now we can see that the volume is right here where this water level is. Now our oceans collect energy from the sun and as they heat up, they actually change their volume a little bit. So to model the sun, I've got a heat lamp here targeted point blank at this jar of water. And we're gonna see how, when the jar of water changes temperature, it also changes volume. Now this will happen over a period of time, so I'm gonna have a time lapse on, so you can see how that change in volume is affected by the temperature. With these two effects, we can look at it in um, another mathematical model and add their, their effects together. So thermal expansion here is shown uh, by this green line. The ocean mass uh, changing based on sea or ice or glacier, glacier melt is being represented by this blue line. Now, if you add those two together, you get this red line. That's the, the sum of the thermal expansion factor uh, along with the change in mass because of the glaciers melting. This black line is the observed global uh, mean sea level rise. And you can see that those two match each other almost exactly. So we can be pretty confident that these two factors are the two primary factors causing the sea level rise. And both of these um, depend on the temperature. So as the temperature of the planet increases, the ocean gets hotter. As the ocean gets hotter, it expands 
and increases the sea level, but also at the same time, ice is melting and adding more water to the ocean. So what does this look like in our future? Um, right now, we're seeing just the tip of the iceberg, if you will. Uh, if we increase uh, by a couple different models here, the RCP 2.6 or the RP RCP 8.5, all you need to know about these is these are basically just two different mathematical models uh, based on the, the different amounts of greenhouse gases that are being emitted, what our future might entail as far as temperature changes. You can see what the predicted change is going to be. And this is measured in meters. Um, so it's possible if we see some of these worst case scenarios that in the next 100 years, we might see a change of one meter in sea level. Now, that doesn't feel like a lot. One meter is something that you can measure um, in a classroom. But one meter uh, difference would be enough to flood major cities that are towards by the ocean. It would also be enough to cause huge impacts if ever hurricanes and sea swells were going to happen in our future. Um, so this is a very, very important impact of climate change. And again, just another summary of this. Uh, temperatures are rising, uh, and that releases or causes sea levels to rise in two main ways, ice melting and oceans warming. Okay, so if we look again at this idea of thermal equilibrium, um, you may remember from the last lesson we talked about that 340 some watts per square meter in must be the 340 out. Now this is a pretty uh, cool diagram. And it's kind of like a Sankey diagram that we saw earlier in this unit. Um, the width of these different uh, arrows represents how much energy is uh, shown there. So in, we have this incoming solar radiation as about 340, like we talked about before, 342 watts for every square meter. Now, some of that makes it all the way to the surface. Some of it actually bounces off of clouds um, or aerosols or the atmosphere, and some goes all the way down, re-emits, and then escapes that way. If we add up this reflected solar radiation and the outgoing radiation just from the heat uh, being emitted from our planet, that also adds up to about 342 watts per square meter. Now, if we do anything to change one of these um, significantly, it's like, for example, if not as much is able to escape, then we are having a net uh, energy imbalance, which then define this equilibrium. We have to see something that is going to be a hotter Earth. And there are lots of indicators that our world is warming up. Um, this diagram shows you just some of them. Um, so the ice sheets are decreasing, sea ice uh, is going down, but snow cover and glaciers. But we're also seeing all sorts of things that are increasing, like the sea level and the temperature and the tree lines that are changing um, more northward as we go. Um, so this all leads us to one final discussion. Um, and that's known as feedback loops. Um, so all of these factors aren't um, really controlled in the way that we saw in that um, diagram controlling each of those climate change factors. Instead, they are all very much interconnected. And these feedback loops really represents that interconnectivity. A positive feedback loop isn't as happy as it sounds. A positive feedback loop is something that uh, represents a warming of the earth that leads to future warming of the earth. Um, so a good example is melting ice. Um, ice has a very high or very high albedo, which means that it reflects a lot of sunlight, but ocean has a very low albedo, which means it absorbs a lot of sunlight. So if we are losing ice, but gaining more ocean, um, that means that we are going to just absorb more because the earth is becoming darker, if you will, and absorbing more temperature, um, more heat. To increase the temperature. And if the temperature increases, more ice melts, and then you can see how that loop forms. Another example of a positive feedback loop is melting permafrost. As the temperature increases, the permafrost that has always remained frozen starts to melt, and that, that vegetation that is dead decays further, releases methane. Methane is a natural greenhouse gas that heats up the, the planet more, melting more permafrost, and so on. A third positive feedback loop is methane on the ocean floor. This is a similar factor, um, but there are pockets of methane that are frozen on the ocean floor that we've discovered, and higher temperature 
of these oceans uh, means that more of these deposits will melt, uh, which then increases the greenhouse gases similar to the melting permafrost. A negative feedback loop is something that it's actually kind of interesting that the increased temperature results in things that then counteract climate change. Um, so an example, they're harder to think of, um, but an example is more clouds. So as you have higher temperatures, um, more water evaporates. Clouds are just evaporated water. So you actually have more cloud cover uh, when the, the climate is warmer uh, and clouds are very good at reflecting sunlight. So the higher the temperature, the more clouds are produced. And then if you have more clouds, you increase the albedo and reflect more sunlight. Another negative feedback loop is that warmer climates uh, are better for plants to grow. Um, so increased photosynthesis uh, in plants uh, absorb CO2. So increased photosynthesis then remove greenhouse gases from our atmosphere, which counteracts some of those factors that we're seeing. And then our last one is more of a sociological feedback loop that renewable investment is going to be greater as the temperature increases. And we see some of these negative effects. There is a stronger push towards investment in renewable resources and other factors that can counteract climate change. So again, there are many reasons that we know that the climate is warming. Uh, next, we will talk about some factors uh, that can help us in these conversations.